Hey, microbiology students. We're continuing on our lecture series on pathogenic bacterial diseases. Today, we're going to talk about bacterial pathogens of the skin in our second lecture video. In my last lecture video, I was lamenting a little bit that I'm spending most of my time isolated in my sauna during the mandatory quarantine days of the coronavirus pandemic as I record these videos for you. And I was telling you, I spend most of the time, you know, recording these videos and sort of talking to myself in here, which is sort of awkward. And I just wanted you to know that I'm actually teaching to somebody right now. I am teaching to my cat, Hunter. So he has come in and now I am teaching him all about bacterial pathogens. Aren't I, Hunter? You want to say hi? He's taking a nap. He's, can you see him? So he's taking a nap on um, on my notes, actually. Keeping them warm, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, it gives me some sort of audience, I guess. Desperate times. Bacterial pathogens of the skin, guys. Here we go. All right, so this lecture video it actually coincides with a lab. So usually in the semester, when we do this lecture, we do the lab 27 at the same time. So you actually are going to do some, some sort of version of lab 27 using some instructional resources that we've created for you. But you may want to take note that lab 27, which is on the pathogenic cocci, um, will be focused in that lab. It's also the focus of this lab, or sorry, this lecture. And in this lecture, um, we're really focusing on only two, uh, two uh, pathogenic cocci, okay, with within two different genuses of bacteria. So we're going to be emphasizing the bacteria within the genus Streptococcus and the genus uh, Staphylococcus. And it just so happens that in the naming of these, of these, um, of these genus, remember that's, that's part of the scientific naming system in science, so this is the genus. It just so happens that morphologically, the bacteria that fall into this group in general, not 100% of the time, okay, but in general, have this particular morphology arrangement. At least they're at least they're cocci. Okay. So remember, staphylococci refers to a morphology where you have sort of this cluster. They form like little clusters of grapes, you know. So this is a cluster of cocci. And then streptococcus refers to the morphology called streptococci, where we have cocci in a chain. So not in a cluster, but they're in a chain. Anyways, that's where they get their name from. So we're going to be focusing on pathogenic cocci, and that's because within these these very broad uh, uh, genuses, um, there's a variety of different species of bacteria. Okay, so we're going to start with Staphylococcus, and then we'll go to um, we'll talk about Streptococcus. So Staphylococcus, there are. I have to make sure I'm not going to write on my, on my head, right? <laughs> so by the way, I've started to include my picture or my video rather during the lectures, and the reason is that I've been reading a lot about distance learning and how to deliver lectures by distance learning. And I read that it actually personalizes your lecture better if you show up with your video in the lecture. And then there's there's actually been a lot of funny emails that have gone along, gone around our department recently um, about how to try to look better on video. <laughs> so, try not to look too shiny. Um, I just be careful with the lighting and stuff. So I've got 
I've got some barriers up in my little window here because, you know, it, the lighting was coming in, especially this time of day. It's about three o'clock in the afternoon. And that's the time when the light comes through that window and just hits my face. And so I look sort of like this ghost, you know, giving this lecture, <laughs> this pasty face and everything. So I don't know if it helps, if it makes the lecture seem a little bit more like what you're used to rather than some just voice in the background, you actually uh, see me. So I've sort of been playing with that a little bit to see if that helps at all. Probably negligibly, I would imagine. Okay, so let's talk about two different strains. So um, then I have to be careful because I know my hand gets into the camera sometimes and I've had to edit out, edit out some weird, you know, my hand and the camera while I'm trying to write on the screen, sort of weird stuff going on. So anyways, if I had to edit that out, that's why. Okay, Staph aureus is the virulent strain and the, uh, the normal flora strain is ep Staph epidermidis. So this is normal flora, normal part of your of your microbiome. Remember, we refer to it as a commensal. Okay, so this slide is about superantigens because one of the things we'll be talking a, a lot about today refers to the virulence trait. So why are certain strains of bacteria virulent while others are not well it's a genetic reason so it's not because the bacteria wake up one day and say hmm, i want to be a good bacteria today i want to be a bad bacteria today you know it's encoded by their dna what they're going to be it's a product of their genes but it's also a balance is the two there's a two-pronged story there that we actually talked about last week which is it is. It does have to do with the virulence genes that a particular strain has, but then it it's that that scale. Remember, I showed you that scale last week in the lecture notes. So, on one side of the scale, it really is the pathogen and what genes they have, what virulence traits they encode. But on the other side, it's the host response, isn't it? It's whether or not you have a weakened immune system or how your immune system just overall responds to the pathogen. Because really the disease, what we see in terms of the pathology and the inflammation, and oftentimes what kills you from these pathogenic bacteria is, is actually your immune response. It's how your immune system responds and if it over responds. So super antigens are actually a type of exotoxin they're produced by both streptococcal and staphylococcal strains that are virulent, and they overstimulate your adaptive immune response. They actually can bind to T cells directly. And when they do that, it causes the T cells to degranulate and release high levels of cytokines. And so high levels of cytokines can lead to a lot of cell death we call that a cytokine storm. There's so much signaling caused by these T cells. In particular, that would be the cytotoxic T cells. So remember cytotoxic T cells with their T cell receptor. Well, if this comes in contact with a super antigen, um, then that super antigen will actually cause the cytotoxic T cell to release cytokines and remember, the cytotoxic T cell specifically releases perforins and granzymes that cause a lot of cell death. They cause cells to die. And that would be host cells, cells of the human body. Whoops. Covered up my down here. Okay, so excessive cytokines. We've talked about cytokines before. Remember interleukins? 
or a type of cytokine. And when you get a lot of interleukin signaling, that triggers the fever response. It triggers inflammation. Um, it makes your nerves hypersensitive. So it can cause a really extreme reaction to, to a particular antigen and can actually lead to death. So it can be really problematic. Okay, so now let's talk about Staphylococcus. We're going to start with Staphylococcus, and then we'll, we'll, we will work our way to Streptococcus. So Staphylococcus aureus, virulence factors. A collection of certain enzymes here. So remember, enzymes are a type of virulence factor. We know enzymes because of, no, of the nomenclature that we've learned, so they end in that ACE, that A-S-E. So coagulase is an enzyme that clots your blood, and this would be an advantage for bacteria because if they can form a blood clot, they can hide within that blood clot and be protected from the immune system. So that's, that's coagulase. So like I said, usually, you know, you guys do this lab, lab 27, in conjunction with this lecture. Now I am assigning the lab this week online. And so you will uh, be um, presented with these, what we call diagnostic tests. And that usually is where we transition in the semester and we start talking a lot about diagnostic testing and how we can differentiate different strains of bacteria based on, for example, enzymes that they have. How can we differentiate a strain? You know, because under the microscope, if you look for, if you look, at Staphylococcus, well, it doesn't matter if you're looking at Staph aureus or Staph epidermidis under the microscope with, say, a gram stain, they're going to look identical under the microscope. So the only way to really distinguish them would be to do a diagnostic test. And the same thing is true with Streptococcus. So one of the things you'll learn about in today's lecture is that some of the diseases we're going to talk about can be caused by either pathogens. They can be caused by Staphylococcus aureus and they can be caused by Streptococcus. And that's true of a lot of bacterial diseases, actually. So there's bacterial pneumonia we'll talk about in the respiratory section, where there's a number of different bacterial pathogens that can cause pneumonia, meningitis, a number of different pathogens that can, that can cause it. And in some cases, it's, it's a valuable piece of information to know which, which type of bacteria your patient is infected with. That might help you determine what type of treatment to give your patient. If you know a little bit more about what in particular is causing the infection. So testing is a big deal in infectious disease. You want to get inaccurate test, and you want to make sure also, ideally, that it doesn't cross-react with other pathogens. So coagulase is a really good test because Staph aureus is coagulase positive. So this is actually a picture showing you the diagnostic test that you can do in a laboratory called the coagulase test. And so what we're looking for is clumping. So when we see the clumping, we would, we would call that a positive test. And this would be positive for Staph aureus. So Staph aureus, sorry. Staph aureus is positive for the enzyme coagulase. Okay, where you see the clumping there. Um, so you basically, there's just blood plasma that's in the in the test tube, and then you inoculate the test tube with the bacteria, grow it overnight, and then you look for this clumping if you see the action of the coagulase enzyme. Okay, so this would be the negative result. Negative result would basically just be um, it would just be very liquid, liquid plasma. And this would tell us that we have a non-pathogenic strain of staph, like staph epidermidis. Okay, staphylokinase, we'll talk more about that one when we get to the flesh-eating disease called necrotizing fasciitis. 
you can tell there that that's an enzyme it's going to let it eat uh, connective tissue never a good thing uh, for us <laughs> catalase the enzyme that neutralizes hydrogen peroxide remember i burst that bubble for you in the disinfectant lecture we were talking about how hydrogen peroxide is usually found in our medicine cabinets it comes in that brown bottle but if you have a strain of bacteria that carries the catalase enzyme it's not useful as a as an antiseptic because the bacteria neutralize the hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water so the way to do that test in the lab well usually what we do is we do it on a microscope slide where you take a loop of bacteria and you just put it on the microscope slide and then you add just a couple drops of hydrogen peroxide and you look for the bubbling because that's a, that's the product the oxygen that's being produced as a result of the enzyme reaction you see these these bubbles form and that is a positive reaction for catalase and that is actually a feature of all bacteria within the genus staphylococcus So all staphylococcal bacteria. So it wouldn't be a good test to differentiate staph epidermidis from staph aureus, for example, because both staph aureus and staph epidermidis would test positive. But it would be a good differential test between staph aureus and streptococcus because streptococcus shows a negative reaction. So negative reaction negative result. This is a feature of, of streptococcus bacteria. Okay, so we start using that term differential as we move through our discussion of diagnostic tests to distinguish one bacterial strain from another because like I said under the microscope it's not always easy to tell. Um, for the strepto, the strepto uh, cox, cocci bacteria as well as the staphylococci bacteria, they're both gram positive and they're both cocci. Now there's a difference in arrangement. So staphylococcus is clusters of cocci, where streptococcus is chains of cocci, but it helps to have, to have some tests to distinguish and also to have multiple tests to confirm your diagnosis. This test also shows up in lab 27. It's called the mannitol salt auger test, or we call it the MSA. It's both selective and differential. And it's used to diagnose a staph aureus infection. And it's, a, it's an auger, so petri dish. Um, when we use this word selective, this means that there's some added component to the culture medium that will select for one group of microorganisms, basically allow them to grow, but it will kill off another select group of microorganisms. And so in the salt dog, in the mannitol salt auger test, the reason why it's selective is it's actually salt um, select. So if you are if you are salt tolerant as a bacteria, Salt tolerant bacteria are within the genus Staphylococcus. So they're able to grow or selected for in the presence of salt. Pretty much everybody else is not salt tolerant. In other words, killed by salt. So we've been talking a lot about differentiating streptococcus. So streptococcus, for example, if you plated streptococcus in a mannitol salt auger test, it would not grow. Okay, it's killed by the salt. Where staphylococcus will grow, but this allows us to take a further step and differentiate. So that's what differential means. Differential usually means some sort of physical change you're observing. So physical change in the medium, usually it's a color change. Um, that distinguishes 
one microorganism from another. And why it's differential for this particular test is mannitol. So mannitol is actually a sugar. So what we're looking for is we're looking for mannitol fermentation. So if the bacteria is able to ferment the mannitol, it will produce lactic acid, and then the pH indicator dye in the auger will cause the auger to turn yellow. So that's what the positive reaction is, and that's positive for Staph aureus. So the way they've done this plate is they've divided it in half, and so on the left side, we have positive for Staph aureus. We're looking at yellow. So we're looking at yellow, yellow colonies, but also yellowing around the colonies. You see that? So that's Staph aureus, and that would be positive for mannitol fermentation compared to, let's go ahead and make a line there so you can see that. So compared to on the right side, we have red, red, reddish colonies and then red around the media. And the original color of this plate is actually sort of an orangey red. So what red means is it means negative for mannitol fermentation. So there's no fermentation. And it will select for Staphylococcus, but it will, so we'll get positive for growth, but we'll get negative for the differential reaction. So this is actually Staph epidermidis growing on the right, the non-pathogenic strain. So it would be a good test to diagnose Staph aureus, where morphologically they look the same under the microscope. That's what this picture is telling us. Let's talk about infections caused by Staph aureus. Primarily, Staph aureus invades the skin. So let's talk about portals of entry. For Staph aureus. How do they get in and cause and establish an infection? So how does Staph aureus get in and establish an infection? Well, today's lecture is all about the skin, but Staph aureus also infects the GI tract. We talked about it in the first lecture video where we talked about um, staphylococcal food poisoning. Okay, so GI tract. It also invades, um, it can invade the respiratory tract, and it also can inv invade the reproductive and urinary system. So it, it can get in in a lot of different ways, is basically what that means. In this lecture, we're focusing on the skin infections caused by Staph aureus. So that means there's a puncture wound in the skin, somehow it gets in into the skin. And when it gets in there, the bacteria in this diagram are shown in purple. We're seeing white blood cells engulf and surround, as well as lots of inflammation. Remember, inflammation includes vasodilation, where you get increased blood flow to the area, redness and swelling and um, that sort of thing. Okay, so some ways that those skin infections can manifest in Staph aureus. So if you see a red swollen bump on somebody's skin, that is usually referred to as a boil. Okay, so red usually sort of hard with lots and lots of pus underneath okay may or may not be able to you know release some of that pus but when you start to get those little white heads that form you know this can be something like a you know just like a pimple although pimples are usually caused by different can be caused by different bacteria as well not just staph aureus okay over here 
we have impetigo. And the lesions of impetigo, usually we see sort of these yellow, crusty lesions on the skin. Okay, so that would be in, indicative of, of impetigo. Both the boils and the impetigo, we would classify those as localized to a particular region of the skin. In other words, the bacteria are not invading the blood. They're just underneath the skin and they're causing a localized inf inflammatory response. That's a little bit different than what we see this baby infected with. So what, what can happen is that babies can get infections of the umbilical stump. So when babies are born, obviously they cut the umbilical cord and they have this little stump that eventually heals and sort of turns black because it dies, the tissue dies, and then it just falls off and there's your belly button, right? Um, well, what happens is if that umbilical stump gets infected, and that's usually because whoever's changing the baby's diapers probably has some staph bacteria on their skin and maybe staph aureus. About 25% of people actually have staph aureus just on their skin. And um, you may be able to transmit it, transmit it in food, that you handle food and pass it on to people or um, taking care of newborns. Taking care of newborns, you can transmit staph aureus to their umbilical cord to the umbilical stump and it becomes infected. And what happens then is the bacteria can enter the blood. And when, when we get bacteria in the blood, that's never a good thing, but it allows the bacteria to establish what we call a systemic infection. And a systemic infection just means that the, it's gonna spread to multi-systems of the body rather than being localized to one particular spot in the body. So the disease that's caused here is called scalded skin syndrome. And this is caused by staph, uh, staphylococcus. So usually there's one more S with this. It's called staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. And they call this S, 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 four S's, right? Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. And common in newborns. Okay, what happens? Well, the bacteria is in the blood, the staphylococcal bacteria, and the bacteria produce an exotoxin that's called an exfoliative toxin. It's a type of exotoxin. And this literally makes its way through the blood where an inflammatory response causes the skin to peel off in sheets. So it's called scalded skin syndrome because it looks like you've literally put your newborn baby in a pot of boiling water where the it looks like the skin has been boiled excessively and it's just peeling off or like a really bad sunburn, you know, that peels but it's a full body situation for the newborn. So the newborn needs to be treated with antibiotics, okay? As long as we're dealing with a strain of Staph aureus that's not resistant to antibiotics, which is a huge problem that we've talked about in this course, um, hopefully the baby will respond to that antibiotic and will be able to recover from this infection. Ooh, let's talk about some really gnarly infections now. Necrotizing fasciitis. So if you get a chance, I would recommend clicking the link that you see on this slide and watching a short YouTube video about a survivor of this disease, necrotizing fasciitis. To save time in my lecture video, I'm not gonna show you the video, but usually we watch it in class. So necrotizing fasciitis, sometimes it's referred to as the flesh-eating disease. And it's caused by either 
streptococcus bacteria or staphylococcus bacteria. These are some pretty gory pictures. And in fact, in the YouTube video, be prepared to see some gory pictures as well. So um, what happens is the guy he in the story, he tells you that he cut his foot while he was surfing and he just had a little you know, cut. And that's usually what happens. It starts with some sort of cut, some sort of puncture wound um, that gets infected with Staph aureus and a particular virulent strain that has the staphylokinase enzyme or staphylokinase is that virulence trait and it is an, a very strong enzyme that will digest the tissue about two centimeters of flesh per hour. Now this is a relatively rare condition. So the point of these lectures, by the way, is not to turn you into a germaphobe, um, although based on what we're experiencing right now in our world, being quarantined um, due to a, a germ, <laughs> the coronavirus germ, I think this is going to breed a lot of germaphobic people. Um, so probably going to be germaphobes for a while after just the pandemic situation. Um, become compulsive hand washers. <laughs> um, so anyways, it, you get infected with this virulent strain of Staph aureus, but remember it's that delicate balance. Why do some people come down with the flushing disease and other people do not? It is relatively rare. And that's because it's that, it's that scale. Remember that balancing scale where on one side of the scale, it's the pathogen and the virulence traits that it has. But on the other side of the scale, it's the host immune system. And are you weak? Do you, have, do you have a weakened response for some other reason? So it's a multifactorial re, you know, disease to understand why some people get this, but it can be crazy bad, okay? So bad that they have to cut away at this tissue that's infected with the staphylococcal bacteria or the streptococcal bacteria, and they can even amputate um, in severe cases. So on this slide, I have the two possible strains, so we can have the, what are called the group A streptococcus or staph aureus. It could be caused by either of those. And what happens is the skin is in, there's a puncture wound of some site of some kind. It could be even a bite, like a spider bite that gets infected. It could just be a cut, you know, something like this. What happens is it starts, it, it starts as that, as just a, just a localized inflammation but the inflammation is really bad. So it gets really red, really swollen, and very hot to the touch. It'll feel like a sunburn. And this is associated with super antigens, as well as those enzymes like staphylokinase that can digest the tissue two centimeters of flesh per hour. It becomes a very important situation, an emergency room situation where the patient is given antibiotics, um, and then there's something called skin debridement, where they cut away at the dying tissue, the infected tissue, and sometimes they have to cut, cut quite a lot of that tissue. And um, the patient needs a skin graft. Okay, so now let's move into Streptococcus pyogenes. So now we're into the genus Streptococcus. So Streptococcus pyogenes is our virulent strain. It's also referred to as group A Streptococcus. Okay, so let's look at virulence traits. So Fimbriae, Fimbriae composed of something called M protein. That'll become important later, so take note of that. It's capsulated with hyaluronic acid. We have something called hemolysins, a type of exotoxin. We have various enzymes, streptokinase, which is analogous to staphylokinase with that um, ability to digest connective tissue, um, dissolve blood clots. Let's talk about hemolysins. So hemolysins are produced by by very virulent strains of streptococcus. Okay, so the way we test for hemolysin production in the laboratory 
is we use a type of auger called blood auger. This is also part of lab 27. So in that lab, you get this um, really cool looking auger because it's bright red. And that's because it's made using blood from actually usually sheep's blood. This is why it's, it's red. By adding sheep's blood to it, we call it enriched. So it's an enriched auger, but it's also differential. And it's differential because we see different patterns of clearing on the blood auger depending on what type of hemolysin the bacteria has. So it's considered a differential test. So which strains, the beta, alpha, or gamma, do you think are pathogenic? So the most path pathogenic would be the beta hemolytic strains of streptococcus. Alpha hemolytic is partial clearing. And basically what this means is the exotoxin has the ability to lyse red blood cells, to, to destroy red blood cells. And we can detect that in this laboratory culture technique. And when we test for things in the laboratory in petri dishes like this, we use this word, we call it in vitro. So we call it an in vitro test. And that just means the laboratory, it's usually a laboratory dish, petri dish test. You can also do testing in a lab that we call in vivo. In vivo means um, living, okay, it comes from the word for life. So this means to test on living animals. So it's possible to do experimentation on live animals in a laboratory setting. And that would be an in vivo test. And that's usually a more complete analysis because it shows you, like if you tested hemolysins on rats, or hemolysins on monkeys, that would give you a more complete analysis on how that exotoxin would, would interact with our body. And when they do an in vivo analysis of hemolysins, they find that not only does it destroy red blood cells, but it destroys white blood cells and it destroys liver cells. So, you know, um, it's not a good, not a good thing. So the beta hemolytic strains are completely, um, are uh, particularly pathogenic. So in lab 27, we do this lab where we grow different strains of bacteria. And you're actually given an unknown for the lab, usually, where you, um, you take a, uh, an unknown culture and you grow it in the lab, and you try to diagnose if you have beta, alpha, or gamma hemolysis. So once again, this is a way to differentiate strains of strep uh, streptococcus. Okay, so beta hemolysis on the left, complete clearing. Where that means where you swab to the plate with the bacteria, you after 24 hours you come back and you see what the what the clearing pattern looks like, and if you see lots and lots of lysis of the red blood cells, that's the beta hemolytic pattern, and that would be that would be uh, Streptococcus py pyogenes or the group A. There's also another strain, we'll talk about it at the end of this lecture, it's called the group B streptococcus. Also shows beta hemolytic. In other words, then that means that you'd have to do another differential test to distinguish between group B um, streptococcus and group A streptococcus. So um, we'll talk about that at the end of the lecture too. Alpha hemolysis, that means partial clearing. So the bacteria, the streptococcus uh, species that shows alpha hemolysis is streptococcus pneumoniae.
which you can imagine is the cause of bacterial pneumonia, one of the causes. And we'll talk about it in the respiratory system video. And then gamma hemolysis is generally recognized as, as a non-pathogenic strain. So for example, there, there are non-pathogenic streptococcus like streptococcus lactis. It would be gamma, gamma hemolytic, no clearing. You should be able to recognize what these um, you know, what these clearing patterns mean, what they, you know, if I gave you that on the exam, being able to diagnose from a petri dish showing blood hemolysis, what strain of streptococcus we have. Disease is caused by streptococcus pyogenes. Strep throat enters through the mouth, through the nose and throat. That's the portal of entry, nose and throat. Here we see somebody with strep throat. So strep throat, sore throat, inflammation of the throat, call that pharyngitis. That's where you see the red, red uh, back of the throat is very red. Usually you can, although not pictured in this particular slide, uh, a lot of times when you look in the back of the throat for strep throat, not only will you see a really red um, throat, but you'll also see white patches on the tonsils. So strep throat is treatable with antibiotics. It's actually really important that you get strep throat taken care of. You go to see your doctor, they'll do the rapid strep te test. They'll swab the back of your throat. And within 15 minutes, they can get a positive result. It's an antibody test, the ELISA test. So they can get a rapid result to tell if you have strep throat. Because obviously, there are a lot of causes of a sore throat, aren't there? They're not all bacterial. Sometimes it's a virus. Sometimes it's just the common cold. So um, a rapid strep test would swab the back of the throat, give you some information about what we're dealing with and what antibiotics to use. So the reason why I mentioned the importance of getting your strep throat taken care of by antibiotics is that it can progress. So the streptococcus bacteria can invade the blood so if you allow that, that sore throat, that strep throat to progress, it can go away on its own, but the bacteria can invade the blood and become systemic. So remember, we can have a localized, so strep throat is very localized to the back of the throat. The bacteria have invaded the mucosa of the throat, but you allow them to continue to grow and replicate and they'll eventually make their way into the blood. And then what happens is we get progression to a disease called scarlet fever. This is a little bit rare to find in today's day and age just because so many of us go and seek medical care and get antibiotics when we need them. Um, but it is possible to still see, especially in, in children coming down with scarlet fever. And here's what you should recognize with somebody who has scarlet fever. So it's caused by an untreated strep throat that has progressed, okay? And now we have a condition that we would call systemic. Oops, cat, he's back. Got interesting again, didn't it? The scarlet fever stuff. Yeah, it's cool. Pretty amazing. So scarlet fever, we get this rash. So you see it's a full body rash, okay? And then you also get, you get this, what we call the strawberry red tongue. Okay, that would indicate scarlet fever as well. 
and obviously a high fever, okay? So scarlet fever because you get the rash and your tongue turns sort of this bright red with this white patch on it, and then you get a really high fever. And then what can happen is that it can further progress to rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever, what happens is the bacteria make their way to the heart. And when they get to the heart, an autoimmune condition develops. It's an inflammatory disease. So remember, autoimmune means the immune system attacks itself. What, why does it do that? It's because, it's because the streptococcal M antigen actually um, gets embedded with the heart tissue and cross-reacts in with the antibodies. So the antibodies that are trying to attach to and attack the M antigen, they actually cross-react with the heart valve antigens, your own heart valves, and it causes inflammation in the heart and it can lead to a heart murmur and it can cause permanent damage usually to the mitral valve and it used to be a common cause of death prior to antibiotics people would let the strep throat progress and you would get scarlet fever and you would then get the rheumatic fever where you have the, the heart condition develop as a result of this infection Lastly, let's talk about, oh, no vaccine. I forgot about that. Good thing I put the bullet point. <laughs> no vaccine. Why? Why would there be, why would that streptococcus not be a good candidate for a vaccine? Well, if you vaccinated against M antigen, what's going to happen? We learn here that M antigen resembles the antigens on your own heart valves. So therefore, vaccinating against M antigen, you would produce an antibody response that would target your own heart, okay? And you would have this autoimmune condition that would be triggered by the vaccine. So that's not good. And that's why there's no vaccine. Lastly, let's talk about beta or beta hemolytic streptococci group B. So the, called the group B streptococcus or the GBS. We differentiate this from group A. Remember, we need to differentiate because they're both beta hemolytic on blood auger. So we differentiate them using a bacitracin sensitivity test. Bacitracin is an antibiotic. You can grow them and use those little filter discs that have the antibiotic. Remember that from the antibiotic lab? Little filter disc has the antibiotic in it. And then you make a lawn of the bacteria on the Petri dish Put the little filter disc on it and look to see if you get the zone of clearing and if you get the zone of clearing then the usually we measure it we compare it to a reference chart and we can tell if we have um, a resistant bacteria or a susceptible bacteria so um, the group B streptococcus is resistant to bacitracin, where the group A streptococcus is susceptibly is susceptible to um, bacitracin. Where we hear about group B streptococcus is usually in pregnancy. So women who are in their third trimester undergo group B streptococcal testing, where they do a cervical swab. And they're doing that because if the if the pregnant mother is infected with group B streptococcus and she has a vaginal delivery, that can transmit to the newborn and it's associated with all of these really terrible complications like pneumonia, sepsis, and meningitis. What can happen is that if the pregnant woman tests positive, she's given antibiotics. We call that prophylactic antibiotics and to treat um, her infection and prevent the transmission to the newborn. Okay, so that is our lecture today on, on the streptococci as well as the staphylococci bacteria that relates to Lab 27.